Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Good day and welcome in. Rob Black and your money. I'm Rob Black. The CPI number came out and it showed inflation cracking underneath 3% to 2.9%. Basically, once again, giving the Fed not the excuse, but the opportunity to lower rates 25 to 50 basis points in September. The expectation on Wall Street is that the Fed's going to lower interest rates 200 basis points over the next year. Some want it to be more close to 100 basis points. 100 basis points is 1%. So that would trickle down into lower mortgages, lower credit card bills, lower costs for companies to borrow money. If you're a small company, that's a big thing. Um, if you're a big company like an Apple or a Microsoft or a Google, you load up on bonds at 3 to 4% and hope, fingers crossed, that you're able to grow profits at 10 to 15% and therefore get low-cost money to buy back shares or do other things with. Lower cost of money is a real thing. Let's talk about some of the other things that we're seeing out there today. Um, kind of a muted reaction to the CPI number. And that's kind of expected because yesterday we got the PPI number that was also weaker than expected in inflationary terms. And that created a big rally on Wall Street. So a big rally over two days or two small rallies over two days, whatever. It all adds up to about the same thing. The markets are doing quite well. Um, a little disappointing, maybe for some, not for me. The NASDAQ's down six tenths of a percent. The Russell 2000 down seven tenths of a percent. The Dow is up slightly, and the S&P 500 is up three points, which is up almost a micro slight. It's not much. Stocks are not falling apart, but stocks are also not rallying. When I look at the big tech names that are obviously a feature on this show, Microsoft's up, NVIDIA's up, Meta up, Apple up, Qualcomm lower, Expedia lower, Pinterest lower. Uber up slightly. It's a little bit of a mixed bag the way that I'm seeing it out of the gate, but it's getting a little bit warmer towards tech as the morning moves on. Let's talk about some of the other issues that are out there. Uh, Mars, as in Mars candy bars, as in M&Ms, they're going to acquire snack maker Kelnova. Horrible name for a company. In a $36 billion deal that's going to bring massive brands like Pringles, Cheez-Its, and Nutrigrain's bars to Mars, not the planet, but the snacking unit. Your kid may go back to school soon, but their phones might not. The national effort to ban cell phones in schools got another boost yesterday when California Governor Gavin Newsom wrote to school districts urging them to restrict the use of smartphones in class. I, I would love that. Um Seems a bit cruel after letting them use phones on school for a few years and getting them used to schools on phones are okay. Elon Musk, 17% of his tweets now are political. That's up from 2% in 2021. Goth water brand Liquid Death and ice cream maker Van Leeuwen. They're teaming up to create a hot fudge sundae flavored sparkling water. What's interesting about that is my eldest son, 15. He uh, can be seen with a liquid death water bottle, um, often in his hands. A tall boy, if you will. McDonald's is a day to be on Happy Meals for adults. What has our society come to? It is a Big Mac or nuggets, fries, and a soda. But you get a limited collector cup. Now, again, let me repeat this in case you heard me incorrectly. Happy Meals, I know you heard. McDonald's, I know you heard. But for adults, you might not have picked up on that vibe. There will be versions of it for breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, if you have to entice me to go to McDonald's with a plastic collector's cup, no thank you. I'd rather I'd rather end my life now than, than be hunting down McDonald's plastic cups. Back to school, it ended basically shopping in July. A lot of people were looking for value. That's a, a trend that we continue to see. When you heard about Amazon and Target and Walmart doing uh, big summer sales, a lot of people stocked up on their back-to-school supplies. 
of which back to school is about a $38.8 billion season down slightly from last year. So that's a blessing. I think we spend about $874 on our children who are in K through 12 on clothing, shoes, electronics, and school supplies. Shoes are a big one in my home. Both kids got a new pair of kicks ready for school next week. Um, 86% of children are in extracurricular activities. They'll spend another $582 for fees and equipment. College students are on the hook for about $1,364 to go back to school. Total college back to school spending is about $86.6 billion. You add that into K through 12 and $38.8 billion, and you could quickly see this is a ooh, over $100 billion exercise in spending. The Cowboys led the NFL franchises at a valuation of $10.32 billion. That's an asset that you and I likely cannot afford. Although, um, asset managers who specialize in family offices and ultra high net worth are starting to pull together money device into sporting franchise, typically on the women's sports levels right now, because the Cowboys aren't for sale. They're worth $10.3 billion. They're the first NFL franchise over $10 billion. Jerry Jones paid $140 million for the Cowboys in 1989. Ooh. Elsewhere, the Los Angeles Rams are worth $7.7 billion. I'm going somewhere with this. The New York Giants up to $7.6 billion. New England Patriots, seven point three. San Francisco 49ers, $6.8 billion, of which... Construction, mall construction, mall construction tycoon. Eddie DiBartolo bought the team for his son, Eddie DiBartolo Jr., for $13 million in 1977. $13 million all the way up to $6.86 billion. Headed towards $10 billion, right? The ex-Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders, worth $6.7 billion. Ooh. If you add up all the teams, they're worth about $190 billion. So again, um, Starbucks jumped 20% yesterday after the company poached this Chipotle CEO, Brian Nickel. Brian Nickel worked at Taco Bell when there was Liv Moss. He brought success to Chipotle. Can he bring the same success to Starbucks? Very good question. The reminder there is that success or failure does start at the top. Um, and then you start filling out the executive branches. The COO, the CMO, the COO. One. They all have value to a big company. Um, so today the big story is the mild inflation reading offers the Fed a green light to cut rates in September. So we're going to move into a new market from expecting interest rate cuts to seeing interest rate cuts. Will we get 100 basis points cuts over the next year or will it be 200? That's a pretty big difference. Exponentially huge. Um, to you and me, we say 25 basis points, one quarter of 1% doesn't sound like much, but 2% versus 1% is a big number. And you know that going back to your elementary school days, you don't need an abacus to figure out that's exponential. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing and more. We're in hurricane season. It can disrupt travel. We could also boost retail sales. Find me online at Rob Black Show. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is the Rob Black Show. Some interesting developments in the world of advertising. The United States government wants to break up Google. This was announced late last night. Maybe it was two nights ago. And uh, separate the, the browser from the company. And potentially its office products. That would help unlock value. Don't look at monopolies as a bad thing when the government labels you a monopolist. Look at it as you want to invest in that and the breakup value will probably increase your share value. Apple has a weird arrangement with Google where they get $20 billion plus dollars to let Google be the default search. This likely will be changed in the future. Maybe it'll be a reduced relationship a halfway house relationship. But Apple did something recently in their operating system, which I do the beta development software. 
So I get to see it six months before you do. And one of the things they do is it's an ad feature where it's, it's an eraser. It's an ad blocker, essentially. It hides distracting items from web pages, distracting items like ads. What's interesting about this is how will Apple let the tracking of ads be known? If you're a company who's buying an ad, like maybe an EP Wealth company I work with, then buy an ad on a sports page and someone with an Apple device says, I don't want to see ads and that ad's not shown. Does EP Wealth get to know that that ad wasn't shown or they still pay for it regardless? Apple's sitting on a potential gold mine of selling that information and getting into the ad industry themselves. Currently, their ad business is on course to exceed $6 billion in revenue this year and expects to rise all the way to $8.5 billion in 2026. That's obviously trailing big players like Amazon, Facebook, Google. But everyone is waiting for Apple to do something big. And they've got the potential margins in advertising much greater. And with the ability to control the browser, they're probably going to get themselves in trouble with antitrust at some point. Mortgage rates dropped their lowest level since April 2023. Should you refinance? There's a big rush for refinances right now. Mortgage rates dropped to 6.34%. Don't know why that's tough for me to say. Maybe it's because I've been up for four hours, but it's a little tough for me to say. So one of the things I do with my children is we play a game whenever we have conversations of what's the bull case, what's the bear case, what's the best case, what's the worst case. Um, my father taught me this of learning how to debate at the dinner table. I guess my father made us practice this where one more, one afternoon we would all talk about homelessness and one day you had to defend homelessness. One day you had to be against it. One day you had to talk about taxing the rich. One day you had to talk about not taxing the rich. When it comes to investing, my son's asked me a lot of questions now. Like my son, for some reason said to me the other day, he goes, can I get seven shares of, of NVIDIA? I'm like, you already have seven shares of NVIDIA. I already bought it for you and put it in your portfolio. And um, he starts asking questions about NVIDIA. He said, what if it goes lower? I'm like, that's a good question. It certainly could. Semiconductors like Intel used to rule the roost. Cisco was the, the ruler of routers, the sultan of, of switches. Um, tech companies tend to go through 10 to 20 year phases where they pass the baton um, to other tech companies. And the question was, when will you know? And I said, when sales decline, when margins decline, when products get delayed, when management leaves, um, when gross margins suffer. So they're asking the right questions. They're not asking how high will it go. Got a horribly stupid email today from someone. And I'm sorry for saying this, but um, it's got 3.3 million. And I'm sorry if you're listening. I know you're listening. And he says, where will my money be in 10 to 20 years? And the answer is no one knows. I don't know what you own. I don't know your risk profile. I don't know um, if you've got it all in one stock, if you've got it in 10 stocks, if you've got it in 20 stocks. I don't know if you have 100 stocks. I know people that have 100 stocks and I'm like, why do you own 100 stocks? It's too many. You can't possibly follow that many. I think the last 15 years in the stock market, I'll go now as far as the last 20 years when interest rates have been in major decline uh, from 2001 through basically 2022 then we saw interest rates start to climb i think that low interest rate environment really helped a lot of tech stocks right now tech stocks aren't being rewarded for being growth vehicles they're being rewarded for being defensive vehicles and having a lot of cash and a lot of cash flow so question like i've got 3.3 million He's got $600,000 in cash. Why would someone have $600,000 in cash? Too much. Um, I know he's only in stocks and bonds and, and real estate. 
So he's missing out on private equity, private credit, private real estate. He's missing out on option strategies. He's missing out on um, <clears throat> all the new option strategies. And there's there's been a lot that now are considered asset classes like managed futures. He's looking at upside. I'm looking at downside and getting market growth. He's looking at maximizing growth. I think he's in the wrong game with lower interest yeah. rates becoming higher interest rates. With that said, <clears throat> it's a little bit frustrating because when you write two sentences, what am I going to be worth in 10 to 15 years? There's just not a lot of information that just shows you kind of like a crazy amount of ignorance. So I play a game with my children called bull case, bear case, 30. best case, worst case, uh, debate both sides of the story. We'll talk a little housing prices when we come back, because I think that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, did we pull forward a decade of housing gains? That's a really good question with the pandemic. Ten. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Sometimes it's looking for the right question, not looking for the results. I'm Rob Black. Visit the Rob Black Show online at robblackshow.com. Listen to archived podcasts, market updates, and information from EP Wealth's certified financial planners online at robblackshow.com. So I last left off how I approach life and philosophy. It's I try to debate. My father taught that to us. He had five boys, then a daughter, which is kind of weird, right? And there's a big space between the youngest and the oldest. And as we boys used to tell my sister, she was a mistake, which is kind of funny, but it's kind of not, right? Um, we were taught as boys to argue with each other, to fight with each other, um, not on a mean level, but I was the youngest boy, so I was the fifth child. And then my little sister, to give you kind of perspective. But at the dinner table, we were taught to argue. I love that. I don't look at her arguing as a bad thing. My spouse does. So if we argue, she's like, you know, I don't like being yelled at. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just kind of, I'm Italian, even though I'm not Italian. So I kind of express things loudly. And uh, I'm never mad. If I was mad, I'd, you wouldn't see me. I'd be gone. So, um, but I express things loudly because I was taught with older brothers to express things loudly to get my point across. Um, one of the areas that I you know, have to talk about is housing. I've got children and I look at the future of their careers. I look at their future of college. I look at their future of maybe buying a house and maybe if they could have two kids, like I had two kids. Um, and one area that I don't see it being terribly attractive is housing. I'm a little bit on the negative side of housing for the long term. Now, I was reading a Ben Carlson blog the other day, and he started talking about two of the financial voices that he respects and how they both think that housing is going to be the worst performing asset class over the next decade. So this is going to be a segment where we take both sides, okay? There's no right answers. It's just compromises. So they both believe, some of his colleagues, that the real estate will be decades worth of returns into the first part of the 2020s. And how do we know this? You can look at what's called the U.S. nominal versus real housing market returns by decade. So in the 2010s, the nominal housing market returns was 45%. The housing market returns that were real were 26%. In the 20, 2000s, it was 47% on nominal housing market returns. So 2010s, it was 45. The 2000s, is 47. Halfway through the 2020s, we're at 49%, already above the number. So they think the next five years has already been pulled forward. If you look at the last 20 years, now, in the 1970s, the housing market returns were up 130%. In the 1980s, 77%. In the 1990s, 30%. So the 90s was an area where housing didn't work terribly well. Out of the last six decades, last five decades and a half, 
the 1990s were the worst time for real estate. Now, again, through the 2020s, we're not halfway done yet because we're at 2024. We've already had 49%. Prices are high. Mortgage rates are still high relative to the price moves. This makes housing unaffordable to a large portion. It certainly doesn't surprise anyone to see housing prices language, languish uh, necessarily for the next couple of years as incomes play catch up. Heinz 57, catch up, no, catching up with a C to prices, making things more affordable. So the bearish case is all about the numbers. You can see it right there. Over the last 20 years, we've averaged 45 and 47% in each decade. Now we're at 49%. If we just hold that norm, it makes sense. Now, here's where you can start making the other side of the argument. Here's where you could start saying that housing prices always go up and there's, you know, there's no gravity. It's become exceedingly difficult for first-time home buyers in today's market. But there's a lot of dry powder with current homeowners. I own a few properties and I could take out easily $2 million and give it to my kids to go buy a home. I could take out a home equity line of credit, no stress. Give them the money and say, go buy your own homes. That's what wealthy people do. They don't let, they don't ever pay off their house. They use the house as a piggy bank and use a home equity line of credit to get another piece of real estate. Not every single wealthy person, but every single wealthy person I know. Since the start of the pandemic, homeowners have added more than 13 trillion in home equity. I've got a huge piggy bank. Now, again, I have it at a very low interest rate. Do I want to take out a home equity line at 7%? No, but now that we're down to 6.3%, I'm, I'm more interested. If mortgage rates continue to decline, there's plenty of cash on the sidelines for homeowners who have felt trapped by the high cost of borrowing these last few years. Demographics, 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 demographics. That's, that's the destiny of real estate. From 1990 through 2010, Americans had 4 million U.S. births. Um, in 2008, that was the peak year for births. One of my kids was born in 2008. Over 4.3 million children. 2010, my other son, it was down to 3.9 million. So he's a class of 1 in 3.9 million. The other one is a class of 1.4.3 million. Kind of a funny way of looking at it. Now today we're all the way down to 3.6 million. In the early 70s, we we're as low as 3.2 million. Number of births. Number of births are a big part of future home buyers. Um, immigration, whether legal or illegal, they're future home buyers or renters that that people buy and put renters in, right? The most common age in the United States where people buy homes. 31 and 32. Interesting, right? So my sons don't turn 31 and 32 for 16 to 18 years. That's when the peak will happen in the next 20, 16 to 18 years. This is all statistics for you. And then after that, we should see prices fall pretty considerably because the number of kids in the United States fall pretty uh, precipitously. Now, again, we're not building a lot of new homes. Homes get rebuilt when there's hurricanes. Every now and then you'll see land, like military bases, be turned into housing, which is bad if you own a home because it's more inventory. So I just gave you the math of it. Between 1990 and 2010, we were roughly 4 million, down to 3.8 million, up to 4.2, up to 4.3, back down to 4 million. During 1990 to 2010, we had a lot of children born. And they're going to be buying houses in the next 10 to 20 years. Over the next 18 years is probably the right say, way of saying it. Because some of them in 1990 are, are starting to get to that age, right? We buy homes on average at 31 and 32 years old. So the kids born in 1990, they're, they're coming into that area. Now, my kids probably... 
can afford a down payment. Now, they're again, they're 15 years away from this. But I've already put enough money in savings for them in retirement accounts for them that they could afford a down payment. And I could always tap my home equity line of credit and give it to them, which is a, a trend right now with Americans. American, um, wealthy Americans are giving their kids money to buy homes. Isn't that crazy, the haves and have nots? If your parents don't own two or three homes, you don't have a future piggy bank for your own home. If you compare disposable income to housing prices amongst a handful of developed countries, things look tame in the United States. The United States has a pretty good disposable income compared to other countries. Like Australia, like Canada, like the UK, like France. Now, housing supply is a problem. And I don't know if we get out of that fix. All I'm telling you is demographics, demographics, demographics is what I see. I see another 15 years of home prices potentially doing okay. And then I see doom after that. Not doom. But also I already see a lot of home prices have been pulled forward in the first four years of the 2020s. So is there an answer? No. In this case, it's debate. And... Uh, I got an A in a college class because the professor really liked my approach. It was a, a college class on homelessness in the United States. And it was 15 weeks of a, a study on data. And the class was probably pretty split between Republicans and Democrats. And I didn't know that at the time. But our final subject, our final test was you had to debate something like homelessness. Uh, it was really a class on security blankets in the United States. And it was taught by um, one of Carter's, Jimmy Carter's. Um, I want to say Knights of the Round Table, but part of his administration. One. And a lot of the Republicans got up and said, here's how we solve homelessness. And a lot of Democrats got up and said, here's how we solve homelessness. And I got up and said, it can't be solved. All our states are different. And someone who's homeless in West Virginia is different than someone who's homeless in Pennsylvania and someone who's homeless in uh, Southern California. 30. It, it's, we're all different. It's too big of a country. It's too big of a, a problem. And to try to solve it with federal one legislation is not going to happen. It has to happen on a state level. And the professor gave me an A. That was my whole grade right there in the the answer is there is no answer the answer is it's a state problem the answer is you can't possibly come up with with something that big same thing happens when you start debating housing prices in the united states you can just come up with your best ideas i'm rob black find me online at rob black show you are listening to the rob black show podcast for more information on ep wealth visit robblack.com that's robblack.com. On Sports Center, they say, let's go around the league. And they're going to show you a lot of highlights quickly. Let's do that with stocks real quick. Peloton stock, a little bit lower today. They announced a multi year deal with Google's Fitbit to basically partner on a slate of Peloton classes for Fitbit premium users starting in September. I could not care less about Peloton. It was a cute story during COVID. It was a cute story when a lot of celebrities started using Peloton and talking about the classes on air. But it's a $3 stock. I used to say something that was kind of funny in my 40s, but in my 50s, it sounds creepy. Um, I used to say, you know, in my... 30s and 40s, I, I could probably date a 25-year-old woman, but 20 would be too young. It's too big of a difference. Um, you kind of want some maturity on people, you know, like maybe to be able to talk about presidents that they've lived under, talk about history that they've seen. Do you remember things like CDs? My kids don't know what a CD is. They don't know what a CD is. <laughs> they barely know what a DVD is, but they're like, you used to listen to music on, on these things? I'm like, yep. Um, but when you start talking about like, you don't remember what a phone booth is, I get that. But a CD? 
So Peloton's under three bucks. I just have no interest. I have standards. It, maybe if I were to be more 21st century, I'd say my standard now is to date someone with 28 teeth instead of 32. <laughs> like you try to lower it a little bit and you drop the whole creepy age thing. Starbucks stock is lower today, 3.3%. Chipotle's higher. Now, again, Starbucks poached the CEO, Brian Nickel, who is a rock star. He uh, did great things at Taco Bell when he did the Live Moss ad campaigns. He did great things with Chipotle doubling their revenue, uh, sending their stock up multiple thousands of percent. Now he's going to Starbucks to see if he can't turn that franchise around where Howard Schultz, when he's CEO, Starbucks does great. When anyone else is CEO, it does poorly. First thing that Brian Nickel, new CEO, is going to have to fix is the orders. It's taking too long to get your order. So before he comes up with an ad campaign, some sort of value, now again, Starbucks is a premium product. How do you sell more product in an economy that's tough? You do it through value. You do it through... Um, Buy a bagel, get a cup of coffee. But he can't do that until he gets the speeds fixed at the stores. I believe in Starbucks, and I also believe in Chipotle. I own neither. Um, I talked about buying Starbucks last week, just to give you an idea. Um, and then it shot up 25%. Boo! Victoria's Secret up 16%. They announced a new CEO. Interesting. Um, I grew up at a time that had Victoria's Angels, Victoria's Secret Angels, supermodels who were like nine feet tall um, and had wings and had magazines that were delivered to your home, catalogs. Today, young women don't really care about that. It's re really interesting. They're saying that Trump in politics is suffering because he's not reaching out to Generation Z. He's just saying, you know, um, that Harris is a nasty woman. And we're like, yeah, we heard that eight years ago when you said that about Hillary Clinton. That's what Generation Z is saying. Now, the boomers, 10 years later, many of them are dead. And 10 years later, Generation Z are more voters. So there is a thing that Generation Z doesn't really care about expensive lingerie that's kind of uncomfortable. They want comfortable undergarments. Victoria's Secret, not so much. So a new CEO may have to bring a new mindset to reach out to Generation Z. Then there's some companies today that I don't know anything about. Alster, that stock's down 23%. Good thing I don't know anything about them, and good thing I don't own them, because that's an ouch. They're a maker of light detection and ranging sensors. They are basically lowering their revenue. Customers are pushing back on projects which may soften near-term growth. I don't know. I don't know. You know, sometimes you just got to say, I don't know. Brinker International, parent company of Chili's. They're down 15% today. I was asking my producer who is in his 30s. I'm in my 50s. I said, Chili's used to taste better than it does today. And he goes, yeah, I think the quality's gone down. But also we were arguing on 20, 30 years ago when I was going to Chili's. I didn't have a palate that was used to finer foods. Now, I, I, if I can go to a Michael Minna restaurant versus going to McDonald's, I'm going to a Michael Minna or versus a Chili's. I have the money. I, it's one of the things that I totally... I waste money on concerts and I waste money on food. Um, don't waste money on clothes. If you see me, I own two pair of jeans, a nicer pair and a rattier pair. And then I actually own a third pair, which I painted and do home improvements in. Um, but I don't have a lot of clothes. So I probably have six t-shirts, probably five button downs, uh, most, maybe one suit. So uh, pretty frugal in some areas, not so frugal in others. I think that sums a lot of us up, right? Markets aren't really doing much today, but we had a big day yesterday. CPI yesterday was showed disinflation or deflation. Today, CPI does the same thing. The markets start off a little bit on the weak side, but they, it's improved. It's improved. Now that the markets have been open in a couple hours, you've seen the S&P 500 go up one half of 1%, the Dow up one half of 1%, the NASDAQ up one third of 1%. After all basically being sideways to down, stocks are edging higher. Will the Fed cut interest rates 25 basis points or 50 basis points in September? 
it's either or at this point in time. And the big question is, do you do 100 basis points in, or 1% in next year, or do you do 2%? That's the big question. you got to ask the right questions right now. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. If you have any questions on stocks that you want mentioned on the air, drop me an email, rob at robblack.com. Um, I haven't done a points in portfolio this month or last month. Um, instead, I've been doing portfolio reviews for people who reach out to me. I am going to start up that podcast that I've been teasing for the first half of the year sometime in the next six to nine months. Um, and that's when I stop doing the portfolio reviews. So I just won't have time. You can drop me an email if you want that portfolio review, that financial snapshot, rob at robblackshow.com. It's rob at robblackshow.com. I'm Rob Black. Um, thanks. I, I appreciate you enormously. And let's get to retirement together. Yeah. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. 